Hello everyone, today is Thursday, October 20th, 2016. This is the week in charts. There's a screaming screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often say, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Just an FYI, these are recorded. Uh, somebody's saying that they had some uh, issues in watching it. Uh, sometimes there's a, a squirrel will get his nuts caught in the wires between me and you. So um, they are recorded and they're posted to YouTube within about three hours or so of the show. So what do we talk about? Well, obviously we talk about current market conditions as usual. Your condition, your questions, your conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, hold off on your stock picks until we get to the actual charts, the live charts. And when you do, just ask about one stock at a time. Last week, I talked a lot about deliberate practice, and it got me thinking: how do we, how do we talk about that, or or how do I elaborate on that as it relates to stock picking and the importance of that, and how to pick the best and leave the rest? That you have to be careful with deliberate practice that you're not just going through the motions, and rather than tell you about that. Let's just kind of dive right in. A couple things from last week. Delivered practice is getting better at getting better. And as I just said, it's not just going through the motions. So deliberate is the key word in delivered practice. Now, last week we were talking about uh, four things as it relates to delivered practice. And number four was repetition. And there seems to be a little bit of a rift between Malcolm Gladwell. By the way, if you haven't read Malcolm Gladwell, I'd strongly urge you to read him. Uh, really good stuff. Uh, fantastic uh, stuff from a psychology uh, perspective. But there seems to be a little bit of a rift between K. Ander Erickson and Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell. And the reason is Malcolm Gladwell popularized Erickson's research as far as the 10,000 hour rule. And I think inadvertently Gladwell made it seem like a given, like, ah, oh, you do something for 10,000 hours and automatically you're an expert. Well, Erickson basically says you have to have a little talent to begin with. And even Gladwell came back and said, look, I could bang on piano for 20,000 hours. And that doesn't mean I'm going to make me Mozart. That's not what exactly what I was trying to imply. My point is it does take a little bit, or I guess the, all three of us are in agreement, it does take a little bit of knowledge going in. And I'll give you a case in point. When I first got started, I was looking at a lot of charts, wasn't sure exactly what I was looking at, but luckily I was able to hook up with someone who did, and they were able to teach me how to read the charts. And before long, I began to help him pick stocks, and we were using these for our own trading and for our clients. So we had that feedback loop that I wrote about in last week's column, which I think was published on Monday. Now, the point that Erickson makes, and the name of the book is Peak by Erickson, by the way. If you're going to read Gladwell, start with uh, Outliers. And tipping Point's pretty good, too. Uh, they're all good. But in... Peak by Erickson, he talked about London cab drivers. Now, I don't know if this picture even does it justice, but what I did was I grabbed a Google map of London and then I inverted the colors or monochromed it, however you want to look at it, to really point out what the streets look like. And you can see they're just kind of a, all these uh, kind of looks like capillaries, just all kind of going everywhere. In order to be a cab driver, you can't just uh, hop in a cab and start driving. I, I don't guess they have Uber over there. <laughs> you have to learn all the routes within a six-mile area of London, and it can be quite daunting. And, and the tests are very uh, comprehensive. And it's a very confusing city to, to get around in. You not only have to know the routes, but you also have to know where all the businesses are, where all the churches are. Uh, points of interest, historical places, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not going to tell you everything that, that uh, you just read Peak, and uh, he goes into, trust me, a lot more details about all this. But the point is, you really have to know a lot. And every day that you drive, if you hit traffic, you have to know alternate routes. And, 
and it's very uh, it's a very complex process to become a cab driver in in London. And what they found in the cab drivers is the hippocampus part of your brain, which looks like a little seahorse, actually was larger in these people, and, and that's the part of your brain that deals with spatial relations. And these cab drivers had this highly developed hippocampus compared to the normal person. In fact, getting back to not just going through the motions and, and considering that deliberate practice, they compared it to the bus drivers. Now, the bus drivers, well, they're driving every day, right? They're, they're driving too. Yes, but they're driving defined routes over and over and over again, and that repetition does not necessarily make you better at what you do. The other thing, too, and I don't want to digress too far, but I've often wondered this about certain professions where you get your degree and then you go out and practice, and if you're not working to get better, would you start to forget what you learned early on? And it was kind of interesting that Erickson got into the point that he used a, like the diagnosing heartbeats or listening to heartbeats as an example, whereas the doctors who were fresh out of med school had had, the, had that heartbeat, I guess, fresh in their mind, what a healthy heart and different uh, heart sounds should sound like, were actually better than doctors that have been around for a long, long time. And what they did with the doctors that have been around for a while is every now and then they had a refresher course, like a weekend refresher, and that got them back up to speed on it. So sometimes repetition does not necessarily make you better at what you do. So think about that when you're doing deliberate practice, when you're looking at the charts or when you're trying to execute your trades, follow your plan, etc. So you have to really work hard to get better at what you do. And one thing I was thinking about recently, and, and I often think about this, I guess, too, is, is that Sometimes the simplest thing when it comes to deliberate practice is to say, okay, well, I'm looking at my charts, but I have to remember that I'm not only doing it to maybe find an opportunity for tomorrow, but I'm also doing it to get better at what I'm doing. And that goes for anything. So anytime you go to practice, just say, I'm going to practice deliberate practice. And sometimes, at least for me, just saying that you're going to do that, especially if you find yourself just kind of going through the motions then you'll get better at what you're doing. And, and sometimes that's all it takes. So last week I talked a little bit about – let me rewind that. Last week I talked about deliberate practice before. And as I often say, obsess before you get into trade, not afterwards. Let me get my tongue unstuck from my roof and mouth. And last week I talked a little bit about – when you're looking at your charts, you're working to get better. So this week, let's elaborate on that some more. Now, I often preach the importance of money management, and a lot of other people do, and I think that's very prudent. However, as I often say, it's garbage in, garbage out, like we used to say back in the computer science days. So if you're picking the best stocks to begin with, you're going to be doing a lot better. So a good offense is often your best defense. If you're picking the best stocks to begin with, you're going to get stopped out less and less and less. And as I often say, you have your methodology, you have your money management, and then you have your psychology, and all three are intertwined. Three chords or three strands, however you want to look at it as – I think it was Ecclesiastes, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. So if you get better at one, you get better at all. If you get better at picking stocks, then mentally you feel better about you what you do, and you're going to find yourself in better stocks. And then when that stinker comes along, and that's inevitable, you have some losses, you're able to toss it out because you realize it's stinking up the joint and you can get rid of it. So now your money management has improved. Now your mindset has improved. And then guess what? Your methodology is getting better too. So all three are intertwined. And it's nearly impossible to talk about one without talking about the others. But the bottom line here, or what we're going to focus on today, is proper stock selection. Picking the best 
and leaving the rest. I know it's cliche, but that's what you want to do. What amazes me is that the same people who are highly motivated in life, and that's going to be you because you're here working to get better, and you're reading my articles and others and going to web, my webinars and others. Not that I'm the be-all end all. That's why I'm saying it that way. But you're striving to get better. And a lot of you are already highly educated and highly successful. Doctors, lawyers, dog trainers, automatic transmission mechanics. And you've studied your profession and you've gotten good at your profession. And now you're looking to expand your knowledge outwards. But what amazes me is... Many times the same people who are highly motivated, successful, educated, etc., they look for perfection in life, and that's what made them successful. But when it comes to markets, they settle for mediocrity. And that's something that I haven't quite figured out yet, and I'd like to someday kind of figure out why that is. And if, if you guys have an idea, let me know. Part of it might be attempting to transfer success. Part of, part of it might be that you just uh, – I hate to use the word lazy, but you don't want to work, work at it for whatever reason. Or maybe you've forgotten how long it's taken you to become successful in your current or prior career. I'm not sure what the reasoning is, and I've been kind of noodling with that for quite a bit. But if you guys got any ideas on why that is, uh, please let me know. Uh, counterfeit currency detectives come to mind. They they don't get better at detecting fake currencies by studying fakes. They don't get some little orange monopoly money that's about one third the size of regular money and look at it and go, "Yep, that's a fake. Give me another one." You know, a little handwritten note with a hundred dollars on it. Up, oh, yeah, it's a fake. No, what they do is they study the genuine article. They study actual dollars to learn what the markings are, what the thread looks like, what it feels like, the weight, and all these other things that that come with a, a real dollar, all these things that um, help authenticate the dollar as being legitimate. And then, this, then the fakes begin to stand out like a sore thumb. So what I'm going to encourage you to do and what we're going to look at today is sub – some big winners, obviously, and then we're also going to look at momentum stocks given the current conditions. Now, now's not the perfect time to be doing this, and I'm going to do a little throwback in a little while to when I did the stock selection course a couple of years ago. And I remember going into it that conditions weren't perfect, but I remember thinking, well, it's either now or never. i got to get this course out because I'm ready to move on in my life. And luckily, we hit a good spot in the market. Okay, and I hate to use the word luck because there is some skill involved. And in order to capitalize on an opportunity, you have to be in the right place at the right time, but you also have to know what you're doing. So, but anyway, we did hit it right at that point. So getting back to this, you want to study the stocks that have made big moves, and you want to see if there was something that you could deduce from that move. Now, before we get into that... Let's talk about deliberate practice as it relates to getting a feel for the stock market. And then on top of that, the stock selection process. And the way I do this is by looking at a couple thousand charts every day. Now, it doesn't necessarily take hours and hours and hours to do this. I can go through the charts fairly quickly. It does take me a while. To put together a game plan by the time I do go through the charts and I do go through the scans and I do go through the sectors and then I put together a game plan with the entry, predictive stop, initial profit target, etc. So that all that does take a few hours. But as far as looking at the charts, I can go through them pretty quickly. Now, if you're a little newer to trading, I would recommend you slow down. And I actually force myself to slow down quite a bit because I want to make sure that I'm not just going through the motions and every now and then I do catch myself really zipping through them. And, and I, I ask myself, is it really, you know, am I just going through the repetitions? Now, one thing that's, that's kind of cool about it is that after you get better and better at it, you will be able to go pretty quick. And then I find the best stocks just jump out at me. So a lot of days I feel like, well, wait a minute, did I just zip through those 
maybe I better rush through them, not rush through them, maybe I better slow down and go through them again. And rarely, or I can ever, I can't remember any times where I really found anything new in doing that. So once you get proficient at looking at the, at the charts, you're going to find a lot of times the best stocks just kind of jump out at you. And it's sort of like, and I hate to say going through motion, but it's like the rest of your analysis is sort of going through the motions because you already have your setups and then you just want to kind of like uh, dot your I's, cross your T's, etc. Anyway, one of the first things you want to do when you're looking at the charts, and it's going to make a lot more sense when we get to the actual charts in a few minutes, but you want to look at 52-week highs. And sometimes you don't have a lot of new highs. So I like to also look at the marginal highs. Now I'm going to look at all the charts pretty much anyway, so I'm not too worried about looking at the marginal highs. But you can look at the 52-week highs, deduce a few things, and then look at maybe like 90-day highs or 180-day highs, and then kind of drill down a little further from there. In my actual scans, I'm going to look at recent highs, recent 20-day highs. So that's going to give me all these momentum stocks too. But the first thing I'm going to do is go through my tradable universe, which I'll show you how to set up in a few minutes. And then as you're looking at these new highs, you need to say, okay, what's supporting this mar market? What's driving this market higher? If you're seeing a lot of bond funds and possibly defensive issues, maybe foods, certain consumer non-durables, et cetera, then – that's not a bad thing, but it might suggest that the market's in a bit of a defensive mode because people still use toilet paper and drugs and on things of that nature. That's, that's an old Arnold Schwarzenegger. Anybody remember that when you used to do a lot of Arnold? <laughs> uh, in a, in a, in, even in a bear market, even in uh, questionable conditions. So you need to see what's sort of holding the market up. Is it established brick and mortar companies? Now, these are companies with real earnings. Uh, a lot of times they have physical locations, and that's why I'm using the um, the term brick and mortar. It's an old Wall Street term. When that occurs, I don't want to go all economists on you or anything, but that does suggest that the, the sentiment, at least, is that – things are going well and people are looking at these established companies. Now, the other thing to ask yourself is, is it technology that's leading the market? And that means that there's a bit of euphoria in the market. Now, there's a little something I've, I've witnessed over the years through all my empirical research. There is sometimes a little bit of uh, – it can be a little counterintuitive. Sometimes your super speculative issues – are showing up. And it's not just when pigs fly after like a big bull run, all of a sudden you have these super speculative issues showing up. Sometimes when the market gets a little iffy, you have these stocks as off the joke that wouldn't know a fundamental if it hit them in the ass. And that's kind of what I'm seeing now. Just recently, it was a lot of IPOs and we've got quite a few of those in the portfolio, some work and some not. And then now it's kind of like these lower tiered stocks that are that are high in volatility that are showing up in the scans. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but sometimes it means that people are still willing to speculate. And I hate to use the word gamble, but for lack of a better word, they're still willing to gamble in the market, even though it's kind of going sideways like we've seen lately. And the other thing, of course, ask yourself, is it commodity related? Now, sometimes you'll get a bull market where – and just recently, for instance, the energies are propping up the market a little bit. It's not a bad thing. Obviously, you could trade the energies, but it doesn't necessarily be the overall market is healthy if it's just the commodities that are propping it up. So what's the makeup of the market? And you're going to get a feel for that in going through the charts. So what I like to do is I like to study the tradable universe sorted by the 50-day HV. If you have TC, I can give you 50-day HV. If you have Metastock, I can give you the formula too, but uh, I just got it off the Internet for that. And as you're going through your tradable universe, which I'll show you how to set up, right now I think I have mine set to 30-day average volume of 250,000 shares or, or greater. And the reason you want to have that quote-unquote tradable universe is you want to make sure you're looking at stocks that have ample enough volume 
for you to trade. And the other thing, too, that people, I think, sometimes lose sight of is technical analysis only works if you have a representative sample. So I'm sure somebody will probably bring up a super, 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 super thin stock at some point during this presentation or go back and look at old presentations. And that's the only problem that sometimes you end up with is you might not have a representative sample of, of people. Remember, as I said in the last column and as they somebody mentioned at the Traders for a Cause conference a couple of weeks ago in Vegas, we're trading traders, not markets. So you have to have enough traders to give you that representative sample. And remember, we're reading the emotions of the others. And of course, while embracing our own, that's my definition of technical analysis. But you have to have enough market participants in order to read the emotions of those participants. So the stock has to be thick enough to trade. So you need to ask yourself, What's trending? What sectors are trending and why? What's begging off the new highs? Where are there any new emerging trends? Okay. Now, along the lines of emerging trends or old trends ending. And sometimes what you'll find is strong stocks start becoming a source for funds. And I guess that's sort of that when pigs fly thing that sometimes occurs in the markets, as I said a minute ago. But sometimes strong stocks will become a source of funds because the the traders or the money managers will cash out of their winners so they can have money to free up slots to buy some additional possibly emerging trends type of, st type of stock. So you have to ask yourself, are some of the old trends beginning to the end? Now, are there a few or a plethora of setups and where are they stacking up? Lately, I haven't seen too many setups. And the big duh there is because, well, the market has just gone sideways as of late, okay? So it kind of gives me a little bit of a dilemma. Yeah, I'm just going to show you, talk about stock selection today, but there's really not a whole lot of good stocks to select. However, if we break out of this range, there will be. So maybe now is actually a good time to brush up on it and kind of like a get ready to get ready type of situation. And that could go either way. If the market rolls over, then then we're looking at emerging trends. Not my favorite thing to do is the shorting, but as I used to say back, uh, as a sailmaker used to say when you get on a boat with us back in my sailboat racing days, when when the wind would get light, everybody would complain, and the sailmaker would, would get busy. He would just kind of make everybody settle down, and he would just start slowly tweaking things. And before you knew it, we were moving. Well... If you're moving at a half a mile an hour and everybody else is just sitting there, you'll win the race. So if his point was, if you love light air, it'll love you. So if the market does begin to roll over, not that it's my favorite thing to do, but you have to learn to love the trend you're in. If you can't be in the trend you love, love the trend you're in. So you want to study success. You want to study the big moves. And you want to honestly ask yourself, could you have caught them or should you have caught them? Now, this is based on your methodology. Now, the other thing you have to ask yourself, is there a setup outside of your methodology that could have caught the move? And this is how I learned everything over the years empirically. In other words, just by looking at the charts. And this is how I discovered things like the trend knockout. I'm like, oh, these really nice trends especially when they begin to go parabolic, have a big knockout move. And I saw that happen over and over and over again. And then I saw the stock take off again. And then I began to wrap my head around that. It says, oh, okay, well, then that's, that's eager shorts rushing in to show how smart they are selling these parabolic moves. And that's also the Johnny Come Latelys who are tempted to or forced to because of lack of money or patience, either one or a combination there thereof usually who are late to the game who are dumping their position and these position these traders could often screw you up in the meantime when they dump their positions and the market so sells off hard so if the johnny come lately's are bailing out the shorts are piling on you see this big sharp move lower then maybe that knocked out some players and if the trend begins to resume the predicament of these traders will help to propel your position along. So is there a pattern there 
that could have caught the move, maybe outside of what you're doing. Now, you have to frame that within the caveat of you can't kiss all the women in spite of what a current candidate says or what the possible <laughs> first man actually tried to do, possible uh, potential first man, I should say. I guess I should not get into that, but you get the idea. You can't kiss all the women or men if that's what you're into. And sometimes things just move. You have to realize that the market could often be a bad teacher. I've said that so many times. It's like I'm even sick of myself hearing it. But just because something went up doesn't mean that there was a pattern there you could have jumped on. Sometimes things happen. Maybe a stock gets just kind of bought out out of the blue. Maybe some sort of uh, people get squeezed. Maybe a hedge fund blows up. Okay, so certain things can happen that have nothing to do with, with good old-fashioned technical analysis or even fundamentals for that matter. Okay, I just said the F word. So remember that. Sometimes the market can be a bad teacher. But if you're seeing a reoccurring pattern, and that's key, a reoccurring pattern. So look for something that reoccurs. For me, for instance, it was the trend knockout. I was like, oh, look at these nice parabolic trends. Oh, look at this sharp knockout move. Oh, look, it took off right again from that and resumed that parabolic trend. Now, over the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about stock selection. Now, keep in mind, I spent 14 hours in the stock selection course. So this isn't necessarily something you're going to learn in a few minutes, but taking on this lofty goal, there's a lot of things I could show you over the next few minutes, and then there's another video on my website, which I'll get to in a minute, which is a little bit longer, and you can watch. And you're going to be well on your way. These are some of the more common things to look for and more common mistakes. And if you, if you can't sleep at night, go in and watch as many weekend charts as you can stand. And as Greg Morris often says, not about my stuff, but about his, jokingly, uh, don't operate heavy machinery after so still afterwards. So stealing a line from him, just be careful not to operate any heavy machinery after viewing these. But in all seriousness, you'll see that probably 90% of what I say when I'm kind of picking apart stock picks is is going to be presented here. There's some very there's very uh, few select things. And these are going to be the majority of ones we're going to get into here. And there were quite a few other ones I had to take out because it wasn't enough time. But you're well on your way if you start with these. Now, the first thing you want to look for is the ability for a stock to trade cleanly. And this is where you ask yourself, does the trend – I guess I'm going to sound like uh, – what's his name? Johnny Cochran or who's the other guy? Does the trend exist and does the trend persist, okay? And persistency is a very important but powerful concept. And this is another one of the things that I discovered empirically. I noticed that some stocks tend to go up day after day after day after day in these really nice trends. Now, mathematically, if you draw a line through the bars, mathematically, that's equivalent to linear regression. And I did spend a lot of time, especially early in my career, playing around with linear regression, trend lines. And if that's something you want to do, uh, do it. But you're better off just looking at the charts and drawing a line through as many bars as possible. This is what it looks like on the downside. This is going to be a little bit rarer because the old adage, they slide faster than they glide. Usually a downtrend is going to look more like this. Okay, with sharp retrace rallies in between. But every now and then you will get a persistent down move. The good thing about a persistent down move, although it's kind of rare, is that it's kind of a Chinese water torture. market goes down day after day after day after day, and then all of a sudden it really begins to implode. Okay, so I wouldn't say don't look for it on the short side. I'm just going to let you know that it's going to be a lot more rare and a lot harder to find. There's only been a few... Uh, persistent down moves that I can remember over the last several years. But it's worth looking for. Now, obviously, something bad is electrocardiogram. Now, I preach this ad nauseum, 
but I'm often shocked at how many people ask me who know who should know better. I should say now some some people have emailed me and says you never like any of my stocks. You like Mike? You hate everything. It's like well, it could be a function of the of the conditions we're in. If the market is chopping around, going sideways, there's not going to be a whole lot I like out there. Okay. But if a stock looks like electrocardiogram, as I often say, if you can hear the beep, beep, beep in your head, you know it's a bad stock, a stock you don't want to be trading. Uh, I use eBay in this one because this was an actual chart somebody sent me, and I didn't know whether they were buying it or selling it. But you could see it looks a lot like the electrocardiogram. In fact, the electrocardiogram actually looks a little bit cleaner than this particular chart. So if a chart looks like that, you know it's not a stock that's trending. It's certainly not one that you want to be trading it's certainly not persisting in its trend now another one is acceleration of trend versus deceleration of trend and we'll take a look at a few examples here in just one minute in both cases the stock is trending okay the big blue arrow i guess in this case black arrows headed up but you have to notice what's happening in more recent times and you can see that the trend is beginning to bend at the end. So let's take a look at a stock that traded cleanly, at least back when it set up. Notice that this stock tends to persist. It tends to go up, it tends to go up, down, or it tends to go sideways. Now, sideways, obviously, you don't want to be trading a stock. But that could be a good thing because that could be base building and people get used to a certain level of, of a stock. And then when it moves away from that level, it creates a disequilibrium. And that's how bases work. And that's why bases are very important. That's why I often say the bigger the base, the bigger the launch into space. So you can see in this case, the stock began to work its way higher. Then it began to accelerate higher. And then it really began to accelerate higher before we had a nice little trend knockout move over here. And that's what I call, for those of you who, who've been to a few of these shows, this is what I call the Arbalus TKO, where it shoots higher one way and then it comes right back in. And that's kind of a cool little pattern. Not enough time to get into that today, but watch uh, some of the weekend charts and you, you'll be able to find that. So in this particular case, you had persistency, you had the ability for the stock to trade cleanly, which are could be used it's sometimes more synonymously but the cleanly is more like the stock tends to go in one direction and then possibly correct and then go again in that original direction persistency is a more specific form of what i mean by cleanly and you can see that it's had some acceleration within the bigger term trend that was also accelerating higher. Now, one thing that I cannot emphasize enough, and it'll probably come up today, is the importance of the net-net change. When we look at individual stocks, I'll probably be asked about some that, that are trending and look good at first glance, but if you look at them over four to six to eight weeks, they really haven't done anything. So that's important. So you want to never forget about the net net. If you're looking at this stock longer term, it looks pretty good. Shorter term, I'm sorry, it looks pretty. If you look at this chart, shorter term, it looks pretty good. It's worked its way higher. It's accelerated higher. It looks kind of interesting. But then notice that it went sideways for quite a while and then began to roll over. So if you're looking at it from here to here, it looks pretty good. But you might not want to play that little setup in here, kind of a TKO-ish pullback type of thing, because one, two, three, uh, let's say four months, roughly, it hasn't done anything. Now, along the lines of net net is losing momentum. If you're looking at the dotted line, which for some reason, again, this is where that psychology thing is going to rear its ugly head. For some reason, we tend to see the good and not the bad when it comes to markets and, and I guess it was I guess it's because uh, I don't know I, I guess you don't want to be a pessimist I was gonna be a pessimist but I figured it wouldn't work out 
and I guess maybe we are too, maybe because we are positive in life, we're trying to look for things which I look for the, the good. But sometimes you have to make sure you recognize the bad too. In a case like this, you can see that it's lost quite a bit of momentum shorter term, even though longer term, it still looks like it's trending. So if you look at a real example like this, at first glance, this chart looks looks really good. Okay. This would jump out at me as a really good looking setup. And if you put that big blue arrow in there, it looks really good. But then when you kind of look at it a little bit shorter term to intermediate term, you could see that it's it's going quite a bit sideways. It's kind of the what have you done for me lately when it comes to markets? And you could see, let's back out Janet for a second. You could see that it's just above 12 here, and then it was just above 12 way back in July. So this is, uh, what is it, one, two, three months or so of sideways action. And let's bring Janet back in. I guess I'm showing my age. That actually was quite a while ago. So you could see in this particular chart, if you zoom in, it's had a 135% run over the past, oh, eight months or so. But then when you look at it over the past one, two, three, four months, it really hasn't done a whole lot. And that's where you got to be careful. And I think this one turned into a short at some point. A pretty good short, by the way. So that's what you have to be careful about looking at the big picture and forgetting about the short to intermediate term. Is the stock losing momentum? Now, returning to a base is very important, too. And if you do watch the weekend charts, you'll see a lot of these reoccurring themes. And one of the reoccurring themes when somebody asks me about a stock is they'll look at a stock like this and they'll say, hey, what do you think? Well, the problem is you want to see a base clear decisively, and then you want to see it pull back and then take off again. So first pullbacks after a base breakout could be a really powerful pattern, could be a really good pattern. Write that down. That's a that's something that I look for every day. Somebody emailed me right before the show. Hey, Dave, could you cover stock selects? I'm like, yeah, today's your lucky day. <laughs> but that's something that you want to look for. Now, very simple. If a market's chopping around, moving sideways, basin, takes off, but then comes back into the base, then all bets are off. And this is what it looks like in a real chart. You had a nice little breakout here, but you had zero follow-through. It had one day. It was one and done, and then it comes right back into the base. So now you're back into the soup. I used to work with the hedge fund, and that's what he always called it when the market came back into the base, back into the soup. Now, another thing that's bad, it's a little counterintuitive, but it's what I call a bottle rocket. In case you're not a redneck, a bottle rocket is a little rocket you put in a bottle. It's got a little stick on it to guide it, and you light it, and it sounds like it's going to just take off to the moon, and then it quickly fizzles out. But it goes straight up for a little while, but unfortunately, it comes back in. So if you're seeing a stock that goes up several hundred percent over a short period of time, and again, we'll see this as a reoccurring pattern, in these chart shows, I guess I don't want to beat you up too bad because we won't have uh, we won't have <laughs> we'll only have good stocks. I guess it'd be a good thing. Um, and then a lot of times they just come back in. So here's a real example: the stock went up several hundred percent over a short period of time, and they come right back in. Now, if you're fortunate enough to be in the original trend, then hang on for dear life. Make sure you sell some to uh, cash out at partial profits. And, and sometimes it parabolic can become even more parabolic. But when it's super duper parabolic, how's that for a technical term? Let's say 300% over a couple of days, then you got to be really careful if you're going to try to trade that because a lot of times it just comes right back in. So I call it a bottle rocket. Overhead supply, it's something I preach about ad nauseum. And this is where you got to realize technical analysis doesn't have to be that technical. You're reading the emotions of others and, of course, at the same time embracing your own. But this is just an area where a market had a lot of trading. So that means there's a lot of traders that likely have some supply waiting for you. 
Okay. It's human nature. I told the story a thousand times. I need some new stories, but neighbor called me once. He wanted to buy GE. I'm like, Hey, well, I don't know. It's got a lot of uh, what I call overhead supply or well, not just me, everyone between 17 and 19. I, if you buy it here at 15, chances are when it gets to 17, the people who buy between 17 and 19 will be looking to get at break even. He's like, uh, I bought it at 19. So he already owned the stock and he was thinking about buying more. People never call me. People that know me at least never call me before they buy a stock. They always call me afterwards to tell them how smart they are. I've actually gotten fights with extended family members because they, they call me up, tell me how smart they are. And I'm like, why would you buy that piece of shit? I have it recommended today as a short on my trading service. Why don't you just sign? Like, I'll give you my trading service. Why don't you just follow along with that? But for some reason, people like to, I don't know, show me how smart they are by buying stocks instead of at least learning a little bit about trading stocks. And they don't have to learn from me, but I'm a free resource for them. Anyway, that's a story for another day. I try not to get it. I try to say that's nice, you know, oh, that's nice. And for those of you uh, who don't know, what that nice that's nice means that that's nice is southern for um f u anyway before i digress too far uh not enough time to get into overhead supply heavily i'll just show you one example here a couple things though the length of it the width of it how far away it is from price and how far back in price and again this is something that we could spend an hour on by itself but just know the concept of overhead supply here was a great looking stock from a while back. This was on my lander list in the service, kind of cup and handle looking, nice little persistent move higher, short term persistency. By the way, short term persistency is a very powerful thing too. And that's something I've learned, also learned empirically. Initially, I was just looking for like one month or about 20 days of persistency. But then I later realized that, hey, even short term persistency, Several days could be important when it comes, especially in emerging trends. But you had short-term persistency higher. You had a first thrust higher. It was also a bow tie if memory serves. We'll take a look at one of those in one minute. And uh, coming off of all-time lows or multi-year lows, at least, it looked fantastic. Unfortunately, you had some overhead supply back here. So your gains would likely be capped somewhere in this area. Not bad for a swing trade, but I like to look for perfection going into a trade. And if the trade, if I don't see, if I see any problems whatsoever, then I move on. So in this case, well, my gains are going to be capped. And you have to make as much money as possible on every trade. So you need to look for perfection going in. If you've got a big mound of overhead supply right above where you make your trade, you know that you don't want to limit your potential gains. Now, emerging trends are a little bit more trickier or trend transitions. And I debated whether to put this in today's slide, but I figured it's relevant. This is a stock we're actually still long from way back in February. And this is what I saw. We had a really nice, what I call tight bow tie, meaning that the moving averages all came together at one nice little fulcrum point. To look at what not to look for or to examine, notice here you had a moving average move higher. And then the other ones are just kind of meandering around. Whereas here you had a really nice tight fulcrum point, point and it's pretty obvious. So this is actually the, the one thing I like about bow ties is that they're pretty easy to recognize and they should kind of jump right out at you. And this, this is a great little pattern for, I'm not going to say new traders, but, but newer traders who are just kind of getting their feet wet with trend transitions. I get more questions about, transitional patterns or emerging trend patterns than all my other patterns combined because it's a little trickier. You can't just draw the big blue arrow and say, oh, it's headed higher. A little tricky. In this particular case, the big blue arrow, in this case, I guess it's red, is actually still headed lower. But the other thing that happened here after you had the bow tie off the major lows was you had a significant move higher. Now, let me just back this out. This doesn't look like it, but this is a 75% move over a short period of time. So this stock took off. Also, there's that little persistency concept. And a lot of times 
I learned short-term persistency simply through teaching because as I look at the charts, I begin to see the persistency more and more, especially these short-term moves, and that can be very powerful. So it started going up, and it generally worked its way higher day after day. Not every day, but in general it did. And then you can connect, if you uh, draw a line, I'm sorry, through the bars, you can see that in that significant move, it was a very persistent move. Or not only to make a significant move higher, easy for me to say, let me get some water again. <laughs> but it did so in a, in, a, in a very persistent manner. And also notice that it cleared the resistance. So if we back the chart out, oops. If we back the chart out a little bit, you could see that you did have a big mound of that aforementioned overhead supply or overhead resistance. And if you're buying down here somewhere, as soon as it gets up to it, it could run into a lot of trouble. But if you notice here, it actually cleared that resistance. Now, you might notice that it pulled back into it a little bit. And I don't worry about it as much once it breaks through. So once it breaks through the resistance, I'm going to assume that some people got cleared out or the potential overhead got cleared out. Um, not enough time to get into it, but there's a lot of other things I look for. Just one of many would be gaps against the trend. And I see this all the time. Unless you're trading a commodity where gaps or common or commodity-related stock, I should say, also, then, or in some cases like a foreign stock because they, they trade overnight, the gap is not a real gap. Uh, commodities tend to chop around, tend to be a little bit more efficient. So you tend to have these gaps against the trend, and that's okay. Uh, but ideally, you want to look for gaps within the trend and not against the trend. So pullbacks are a healthy thing, but you don't want to see a gap in your pullback because people are possibly looking to get out and get out fast. That gap is a sign of weakness, an extreme sign of weakness, and you want to avoid it. Uh, okay, GFA to CNX. We'll take a look at that. Let me get to the charts. CNX. So what I would recommend you do is study big winners of the year and other periods. And then sometimes a good thing to do is sort all the stocks by relative strength for the period you're studying. If you want to go back and do that, even if you're not doing your daily analysis, if you just want to go in and start studying charts, you could do a relative strength sort over, let's say, three months or six months or however long you want to look at it and look at the big winners over that period. And then, again, ask yourself, could you have caught them? If not, why? And then there always won't be a defined pattern. It, at the least, was it on your radar? Now, this doesn't happen to me as much as it used to, but it used to happen to me more, uh, more frequently, I should say. A lot of times I'd have a stock on my Landry list or someplace that would take off, go up 100%, 200%, whatever, and I didn't take the setup. And my wife, when I tell my wife, she says, well, at least it was on your radar. Well, that does it really. That and uh, five bucks won't even get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. But the good thing is at least you were in the hunt. At least you were closing it on. At least you were close. And then I guess in my case, at least clients saw it and maybe somebody was able to capitalize on it. I find that doesn't happen as much as it used to or it rarely happens because I always have a reason whether or not I'm going to take a position or not. And if something looks good but I have some problems with it, you have to be able to walk away and be okay. I don't want to get too far into psychology because I know I'll digress. But if you're looking at something and you think, that ah, looks pretty good, but there's some overhead supply, but it doesn't trade that cleanly, but there's a gap against the trend, but the market's kind of chopping sideways in here. You know what? I'm not going to take the trade. Well, and here I go into my psychology rant, but let me just got a just couple points. Just realize that you have to be able to, to walk away and be okay. And sometimes you just have, you're going to have to just let things go and that's okay. All right. Oh, I know what I was going with. The other thing was life, like trading, boils down to making decisions and living with them. 
And making decision is pretty just is pretty easy, but living with them is not. I'm not going to make the joke that I normally make. But that's the thing. So make the decision not to take the trade and live with the outcome, or make the decision to take the trade and live with the outcome should it turn into a negative outcome. All right, let me stay off that psychology rant. Okay, um, again, a good defense is important, but you're going to need a good offense to begin with. So right now, between now and Monday, I have my stock selection course on sale. And what I'm also going to do with that is give you one year of the trading service, which retails for $14.97. So here's the thing. Yogi Berra once said, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. This way, and this is something I feel very proud of, is I'm able to show you how to pick stocks, and then you can follow along with me for a whole year. And I think this really will accelerate your learning curve, and it kind of kind of dovetails in with these things that Gladwell and especially Erickson talked about, is that you'll need some of that existing knowledge to begin with and then go through deliberate practice. And then hopefully after a year from now, you'll say, hey, Dave, that really worked out pretty good. I'd like to keep you on staff to help me find those setups. By accident, I found this this morning. This was the watch list that I built when I did my, evidently must have been in, in 2013 when I did the original course. By the way, if you get a course, anytime I update the course or do anything follow up to it, you get free access to that. And if I put that updated part into a new course, you'll get free access to that too. For instance, I did the stocks. In the stock selection course, I talked about IPOs. And then uh, later on, I did a full-blown IPO course. So the people who did the original course got access to that part of the um, – got access to the IPO stuff, okay? Or at least a discount to that. If I do a full blown, if I do a full blown stock selection course, you get access to that. If I do a, uh, let's say a, a full blown course where I cover all aspects of trading, the stock selection part, you get access, free access to that. Okay. So anyway, I thought this was kind of cool, and I found this by accident. I was looking for uh, some graphics this morning. This was the actual watch list that we came up with. These eleven stocks on 12 13 2013 and this was I forget how long afterwards but this was like a couple of weeks afterwards as you can see the gains were pretty substantial uh, with the exception of a couple of them in there now this is with no money management this is just raw stock selection and the outcome so I thought that was kind of cool pretty proud of that so there's a link right here uh, right now there's a little uh, uh, I don't know what you call it ribbon that comes down on the website you can click on that too when you log into the website Okay, um, I don't want to get into too many announcements, but basically that that's the main announcement this week. Courses on sale with the um, service. And speaking of service, uh, if you are broke or cheap <laughs> or just getting started, we all have to start somewhere, or been burnt. Yeah, if you've been burnt by a lot of other people and you're out of money, or you're tired of spending money, then at least get on my delayed service. If you go to the little, uh, I guess, a little tricycle on my website, not tricycle, a bike with training wheels, go through that to-do list of 10 things to get started, and somewhere maybe like number five in that list is get on delayed service. The delayed service is approximately one week delayed. Sometimes it's a little bit less, and sometimes it's a lot more, depending on how things set up. And I've, I've gotten a lot of good compliments on the uh, delayed service some people actually became profitable by following the delayed service and actually upgraded to the real time so i'm very flattered at that all right let's hop into the charts let's run into some uh stock selection and then if you guys want to start uh yeah keep the uh, individual stock picks uh coming and we'll, we'll jump into that in just one second uh, we'll, we'll cover tradable universe and i want to show you some of these concepts we just talked about and then we'll hop into the individual stocks. First thing I do is I sort all stocks by 250-day volume, which is right here. And 
to those who want to know what I'm using on that, I I forget myself. It's two hundred fifty thousand on average, and it's I got to set it thirty days right now. Two hundred fifty thousand. So I take this list and then I find the last one in the list. I was muted for a second there. It's 30 days, 250,000 average. I take the list and I flag all the ones that have at least 250,000 over 30 days. And then I copy them over to my tradable universe. So I copy all the flag signals. And then right here, you'll see I have TU, that's tradable universe. So that's my tradable universe. Now I look through most of these stocks, not all of them, but most of them daily. And I want to show you some of the things that that I do. First thing, like I said earlier, we can look at we can look at price as a percent of the 30-day high. And by the way, uh, as you're going through these, if you see any big moves that happen shorter term, then you want to also ask yourself, self, could I have caught that move? So these are stocks that are making 52-week highs. A couple of them will be buyouts or something like that. It, you would just ignore those. But as you start going through these, you'll begin to get a feel for what's driving the overall market. Now we're going to go through most of the all. We're going to go through most stocks. I don't know what's wrong with my mouth today. But you can see a couple of these are buyouts. Now here's a five-year corporate bond fund. So. There's nothing to get excited about here. There's nothing tradable, but you have to make a mental note that, wait a minute, a bond fund is high in the list. Here's another bond fund. Here's another bond fund. So here's Bill, which is a, a three-month treasury. There's another one. Okay, that was actually a short one. But you get the idea that these bond funds are kind of like high in the list. Because on a relative strength basis, they're doing pretty good. On an absolute strength basis, I guess they're doing pretty good. Another another bond fund in here. Now, here's a stock that's trending higher. So I'm going to make a mental note of this and maybe an actual note, too. I'm also going to flag it because I want to copy that over to my momentum list. So that's the first good-looking stock that I've seen so far That's making that's also making new highs. I don't want to jump in and buy it today, but this stock looks pretty good. So I'll flag it and then move it over to my other watch list. Another bond fund buyout. I would ignore that. Buyout, ignore that. Okay. And this is something that's trending higher. So I'd make a mental note or an actual note saying, okay, that's a metals and mining stock. And then maybe I might want to flag that one too. There's another bond fund. So we're seeing, we, we saw one normal stock, I should say. And then we saw some junk fund, some junk bond funds, some regular bond funds. There's another bond fund. So the makeup of the new high list, mostly bond funds at this juncture, and a couple of interesting stocks, like this would be interesting. I would copy this over to my momentum list, and it's already in that, I know. But And now here's a case where it's like, okay, here's the big move. Was there a pattern here? a tradable pattern here that I could have caught this move. Okay. And then we had a, I think this was on the Landry list a while back because it had a nice little pullback back then. There might've been some other issues, but ask yourself, could you have caught that particular pattern? Okay. In this particular case, this thing just shot higher in one day. The answer is no, it's probably a buyout for some reason. Domino's pizza. That's kind of interesting. We got a, a restaurant, I, you know, use that term, loosely <laughs> let's break it out to new highs in here so you might want to make a note of that there's a chemical company another bond fund so we're seeing a, a whole bunch of bond funds and then some another bond fund and then a few miscellaneous stocks like this one right here sorl let's make let's flag that one okay now keep in mind when you're going through this list you're not going to spit there's a bank there's an airline okay so I happen to know through yesterday's analysis, transports are doing very well. So where are the new highs? We saw some transports. We saw a technology stock or two. We saw a restaurant. 
And we're seeing a lot of bond funds. And there's another bond fund, okay? So as you go through this new high list, you begin to get a feel for what's going on. There's a pipeline. There's another bond fund. So a lot of bond funds and not a whole lot else, at least at this juncture. But here's an interesting piece of information. Here's a Latin American fund, an ETF. Flag it, okay? Make sure it goes into your watch list. Maybe some South American stocks might be worth trading, okay? Maybe this ETF in and of itself may be worth trading. So you're looking for clues in the overall market by going through this new high list. And anything that looks remotely interesting, here's a semiconductor. Well, I happen to know that semiconductors are doing fairly well. So I'll make a little note of it, or I'll just flag it in this particular case. There's another bond fund. So quite a few bond funds, and there's a few stocks in here that are kind of getting interesting. Brazil, there you go. Latin America, right? Moving higher. Moving higher in a fairly persistent manner. Breaking out of a base. Put it on your watch list, okay? So you kind of get an idea in how going through these stocks gives you a feel for what's leading the market higher. There's a food stock, okay? Flag it. So that gives you an idea of what's happening. Now, once you do that, and again, ask yourself, was there a pattern that it could have caught this move? Here's another commodity stock, steel stock, okay? It's also, it says ADS, so that means it's foreign. It might be a Latin American steel stock. I don't know. I'll find out later when I do some further analysis. But you take these stocks off the new high list and put them into your momentum list for further analysis. So let me just copy these over. And then I like to go through, it depends on the conditions, market conditions. I might go through two or 300 of these, maybe 400. Depends on what's going on. And then I can eliminate these from my tradable universe because I've already looked at them. And they're not set up anyway, by the way, because they're all at new highs. They're not pullbacks. We're going to trade mostly pullbacks. So let's remove these from the watch list. So now we've already gotten rid of eh, roughly 100 stocks. But we did copy them over to my minimalist. The next thing I like to do is I like to sort everything by the 50-day HV. Now, I'm still going to run a scan on all these stocks, okay, or, or on the entire universe of stocks, not just my tradable universe, to make sure I didn't miss anything. But right now, I'm just trying to get a feel for what's going on and where the setups are stacking up. Now, this, these are the stocks sorted by volatility, and the ones really high in this list with HV of like 200, 150, 175, they're going to be... A little too crazy to trade, even by my standards, okay? But I do kind of pay attention to what's going on. For instance, here's a three-time junior bull fund for gold. But you can see that it's mostly headed lower. So this gives me another piece of the puzzle. It tells you that gold stocks are likely, are likely headed lower, or at least have been headed lower. So... I factor that analysis into my nightly analysis. And as I continue to go through this, once we start getting a little closer to, let's say, 100 in, or below, that's where we might start seeing some setups that are worthwhile. This is kind of interesting. Uh, again, I don't like to trade these uh, three time shares or whatever for various reasons. The tracking errors are abysmal, and there's a bunch of other reasons. But... And looking at all these stocks, I say, well, wait a minute. This is kind of a cup and a handle. I bet it's also a bow tie or a bow tie ish. Well, a bow tie back here. So I know that looks like this is bottoming out. Well, this is a short fund. Okay. So it's bottoming out. So it means just the opposite. So what's going on to gold? Maybe gold's in trouble. So now I know in the back of my head, gold might be in trouble. And just start going through these and just get it like this. Here's a little biotech stock took off. Well, there's none of my trading patterns here that would have caught this. Okay, you have to be honest with yourself. And then I don't see anything brand new. Now, if you're a breakout trader, you could argue, well, I broke out. Well, 
I'm not a breakout trader and I don't like trading breakouts because more often than not, breakouts fail. Now, this is something that I would put, I would flag, okay? It's a little bit volatile. It's kind of a penny stock. HV is way up here, but I'm not going to judge too much when I'm making that first pass. I'm just going to flag things that look interesting. This one's probably pulled back too much, but this is one that's been on my lander list for a while because it took off and then pulled back, also accelerated higher. You could argue that, well, the run has been a little bit too extreme, and I agree with you. HV is kind of crazy. But upon initial glance, if it looks interesting, don't pick it apart. Just grab it, okay? It's just a couple of keystrokes. Here's another one. Now, what is this? This is an energy company, independent oil and gas. So keep going through these and notice the makeup of your momentum list. Here's another energy company. So what is this telling me? It's telling me, hey, Dave, energy companies are looking pretty good for the most part. There was a stinker in there. But I am seeing a couple of big winners in the energies. Gold stocks are probably dubious. Here's a little biotech company. Not that I necessarily want to trade this one. Kind of crazy. HV still high, pretty high. But I'm going to flag it because that looked pretty interesting. And anything that's wide and loose, let your cardiogram pull back too far, you just want to toss those out, okay? And that's how I can go through this quickly because I'm looking for all these different things. And because I know what a winner looks like, electric cardiogram is easy to toss out. For instance, at quick glance, well, first of all, there's nothing here to excite me. And I'm not going to short a stock way down here. But immediately this jumps out is look at this overhead supply. So I definitely wouldn't want to buy that stock. So the more you do this, the more you get a feel for what you're doing. Obviously, you need to have a general idea of what you're looking for. And what some people have told me, and you'll see a testimony if you go to the uh, stock selection page. Oh, by the way, that's where the video is, uh, the longer video on stock selection. It's on the stock selection page, which I showed earlier. Uh, just go to the store, my website, and the shop now. And then uh, go to stock selection page, and you, you can get uh, there. So this is something. This is a little drug company. Not that I necessarily want to trade this, but this is kind of interesting. It took off, pulled back a little bit. So it wants, I'll put that in my watch list. So you get a feel for how this works and for what's going on in the overall market. So it's kind of interesting now. I, I find myself mostly building a watch list but not seeing a whole lot of great setups at this juncture. Now, after I do this and get a good feel for things, and a lot of times I'll get a lot of setups just from doing this, okay? But the next thing I want to do, and I'll give you all these scans, uh, is you want to go to the overall market. Now, it looks like a lot of work, and it is, but for me, it's like being on a treasure hunt, okay? If I do my job properly, I'm going to get paid handsomely for going through all these stocks. The next thing I do is I sort all the stocks by by volatility first, and then by, oh, let me copy these over real quick. Did I do this already? So I sort all the stocks by volatility, and then I sort by a simple pullback scan, which is looking for recent highs, okay? So once we get past some of these ones that are kind of wild and crazy up here, here's a wild and crazy one, but why did my scan pick it up? Well, it made a high, and it pulled back from the high. You see that? Okay. This looks like a bottle rocket to me. We just talked about that. I would not trade this stock. It just shot up. It's too dangerous. It'll probably come right back in. This looks kind of interesting, okay? And notice I flagged it a little while ago. It's taken off, pulling back. At the least, I would, I would copy to my minimalist. There's a persistent stock. We, we just looked at that one a few minutes ago. So as you go through this list, again, all these things I talk about, and the reason I can go so fast is because I could see it on the fly. For instance, I see... Right here, this stock has a tremendous amount of overhead supply. It's also a triple inverse ETN. It's something that avoid that like the plague, okay? But here's another stock, just tremendous amount of overhead supply. So I know electrocardiogram, electrocardiogram, overhead supply. So you could see after a while, once you know what you're looking for, you could go quicker and quicker. Now, what I have to be careful about is not to – just go through the motions. But you can see Twitter. It's all over the place. Okay. I had some excitement about being bought out. Nope. Change my mind. Anyway, I'm not going to go through all this. Don't worry. I won't go through all. And there's just simply not enough time. But as you can see, 
this is the, the general process of doing this. Again, electrocardiogram, I don't want to focus too much on what looks bad because what are we doing? Well, we're like the counterfeit currency detectives. We're doing what? We're looking for we're looking for good looking stocks. We're also looking for stocks that previously made large moves and we're asking ourselves, could we have caught those moves? So that's in a nutshell, that's stock selection, that's nightly analysis. And then I also take a look at all the sectors, make sure I didn't miss anything. If something looks interesting from a sector perspective, I might drill down within that sector and make sure I didn't miss anything too. If I find a setup that I like, let's say it's a biotechnology stock and I think I might actually buy it the next day, what I'll also do is I'll look at all the other biotechs that are that are tradable, that have decent volume to make sure there's not something that looks even better. And also you want confirmation in what I call sexy sisters and sexy brothers. Okay, uh, any questions on that before we move on? Uh, Steve is asking about GFA versus CNX. Well, CNX set up back here in February. This is GFA. So let's take a look at CNX real quick. So it's kind of hard to see. It does look like electrocardiogram, but if you had this chart zoomed in, as we did earlier, you could see that it was a little bit cleaner in the chart. Now, again, this is a, an emerging trade pattern, so it's a little bit harder to see some of the things and not the not the obvious things like the trend. But you can see in this particular case, like I said earlier, you had some overhead supply. It made it through it. This move from here to here was very significant, about 75% or so. Yeah, 80% move, okay, before it pulled back. So that's CNX, GFA. Uh, GFA was kind of a penny stock back here. It was kind of choppy if we're comparing it to back in the day. Uh, it did sort of bottom out, which is kind of interesting. Let's check the bow ties. It sort of bow tied. Okay. Now, in this particular case, it took off, but I probably wouldn't have taken the setup because you've got some issues back here. And then let's zoom in, zoom out a little bit. Longer term, it seems like it was a little bit more all over the place. And then lo and behold, it really didn't. It took off somewhat nicely, but then it stalled out and then came right back in. So I don't really see anything to excite me with this stock as opposed to the CNX, which was a little bit more cleaner in the setup, which cleared the resistance, which wasn't choppy like this one is but now I hear you it's beginning to wake up so let's back the chart out a little bit it looks okay uh, we do have now this is a long time ago but the amount of it is still significant because it was for so long for two or three years this stock went mostly sideways keep in mind that markets have long memories the further you go back in time the less important this is with the caveat that if you have a lot of it, you shouldn't completely ignore it. So this stock could run into trouble eh, around 250 or so. Now, does that matter? I don't know. If, I, if you got in down here and you got out at 250, that's better than the poke in the eye. But for me, I'm not seeing a whole lot to get excited about just yet. Now, you have to keep in mind that stock personalities change. Sometimes nice trending stocks become choppy and vice versa. You might have a really thin stock that starts getting some volume coming into it, and now you have a better representative sample, and then you have some demand, and then more institutions get interested, and so on and so forth. Then you have a nice trending stock. You might have a biotech or IPO or something more speculative that looks fantastic, and as it becomes more and more popular, more and more funds begin to pick it up to a point where – they tend to cancel each other out. That inefficient stock, a stock, in other words, capable of making a large move, becomes more and more efficient, more choppy. All right. Steve got the point. Thank you. Con, emerging trend. Oh, before we jump in, let me just show you a few sectors real quick. I promise we'll jump right back out to the uh, – the sectors, the transports, as I said, the market in a minute have kind of woken up a little bit in here. 
Remember earlier when we were doing our analysis, we saw uh, um, an airline or two waking up. We also saw a bank that was uh, at New Year, new highs, or it's a little further down the list of memory service, but I did see a few banks, at least in last night's analysis, that was breaking out. So you can see banks are kind of pushing the new highs. Not that I want to rush out and buy them, but if you take a look at like the regional banks, uh, today notwithstanding, they're looking pretty, or yesterday notwithstanding, they were looking pretty good recently. You can see they're trying to break out the new highs. Some of that might be foreign banks, which are doing really well, which might be led by Latin American banks. So you can see how all the pieces begin to come together. You begin to get a feel for a market. You do this every day, and you work to get better and better and better through deliberate practice. And then you get a good feel for what's going on in the markets. People have told me before, and I'm not bragging because I get, my, believe me, I get my ass handed to me quite often. So it, it's a totally humbling experience to try to be a trader, okay? And the reason you use the word try is be, reason I use the word try is because anytime you feel like you got it and that you are, it's like you get your butt handed to, to you and it's humbling. But people have told me in the past that I have this uncanny ability to get the feel for the markets. And it's just because I'm doing a lot of this analysis every day and I'm trying to work to get better and better and better at it. Okay. Now, take a look at like the NASDAQ, I guess, before we hop into the individual uh, stocks. Keep, keep the stock picks coming. I'll, I'll stay until we get them. Uh, I'll try to get as many as possible. NASDAQ, let's go back to that net net thing we just talked about. Okay. Where's the NASDAQ? I don't know, 5,200 round numbers. Where was it back in August? 5,200 round numbers. Okay. So August 5th to today, as of 1116 a.m., 1216 Eastern. It hasn't done anything, okay? So two and a half months of sideways movement, the people say, well, Dave, well, what do you do? You say don't pick stocks because the market's going sideways. Well, how do you know the market's going sideways? Well, sometimes it starts going sideways, and then your positions don't really work out, and obviously that happens. But sometimes you could look at the market and say it's going sideways. You've got two and a half months of sideways action. The other thing that has me a little concerned is that these indices are losing a little bit of momentum, okay? You can see the 10 is crossed below the 20 and the 30, and the 20 and 30 have turned down, could be crossing soon. S&P 500 actually bow-tied down not too long ago on a daily chart off all-time highs. Somebody asked me if I was worried about that. It's like, well, follow-through is key. And then the other thing to remember, too, when you're trading something efficient, like an overall market, it's a little bit harder to get your timing right. But you can't ignore the fact that you did bow tie down in here. But for now, so far, the market is kind of hanging in there, chopping around. We didn't get a whole lot of follow through from this. I would keep an eye on a weekly bow tie. And then that, if that happens, then I'd become more concerned, as I did last summer. But S&P 500, just kind of chopping around in here. It just can't seem to get any traction. Maybe we're in a holding pattern because of the election. I don't know. Russell 2000, bow tying down off of multi-year highs. A little concerned about that, but I'm just keeping an eye on the bottom of this trading range, trading range 120. As usual, follow through is key. So as long as we hold above 120, I'm going to feel, I don't feel great about it, but I feel like the market is hanging in there. One thing kind of interesting is that uh, metals and mining have improved a little bit as of late, but as we just saw earlier, gold not doing so hot, silver not doing so hot. So the fact that metals and mining, and again, I wouldn't rush out and buy metals and mining overall, but metals and mining is kind of hanging in the air sideways at worst, whereas gold and silver getting cream. So that tells me that maybe within the metals and mining, there's some selected metals and mining that are doing really well, and maybe I need to keep an eye out for opportunities there. So you see how all the little pieces begin to fit one piece after another after another, and that's how you get a feel for what's happening. And if you didn't know anything, then draw your arrows in the indices. That's a great place to start, okay? Some sectors not looking so hot. Biotech was just at brand new multi-year highs. I was pretty excited about that, and we've since rolled over from there, okay? Retail, not looking so great. So that's kind of concerning. Some areas like the semis, eh, doing so-so, just off of all-time highs, kind of like the NASDAQ itself. 
So pretty mixed within the sectors. Okay, let's take a look at some of these stocks in here. Baba, probably not gonna like Baba because it's uh it's such a thick stock. It trades a bazillion shares a day. But I hear you. It's it's uh it has traded higher. You do have a gap in here, a little choppy, a little wide and loose. But now, if anything, and I hate to say put a gun to my head, my wife asked me to stop saying that. But <laughs> I guess as a trader, you got to be careful saying that, right? Uh, if anything, it looks like a short. I would not short it. Don't get me wrong. But if anything, it's lost some momentum. What's your net net here? Okay, so nine to twenty. That's what uh, about eight weeks, roughly month almost two months of sideways trading so if anything it looks like it's lost momentum looks like it could be in trouble if you long stay long okay con emerging trend no uh con was an emerging trend con was on my lander list forever but look at the amount of day with an emerging trend i like to see a market take off have like a one bar pullback and then take off again, or just a few bars pullback. Notice how many days it's pulled back. So it's it's headed lower for how long? Uh, it's down 17% over a month. So it's going down for a month. So I would leave that one alone. Yeah, it might still have made a big picture bottom, but I think I would leave it alone based on that. Box for AJ. Glad to see AJ. Glad to see some new guys in here too. Um, this is not bad. It has made a nice run higher. It has accelerated higher. The only thing that's kind of jumping out at me, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I would pass because of the number of days of the pullback, but it's certainly not bad. Now, this is where the net net gets a little tricky, and this is where I do get a few questions. You have to look at the trend in and of itself. This trend is pretty serious here, and in fact, in more recent times, you can see it accelerated higher if we move this trend line down. So this is a pretty good-looking stock, if I can get this thing to work. Okay, so I wouldn't get too excited about the fact that it's here and was here a month ago, because I think this pullback, this uh, th I'm sorry, this trend, accelerating trend it trumps that, and that a pullback is actually a healthy thing in this particular case. Unfortunately, as I said earlier, too many days of the pullback, so I would pass based on that. But good eye on that one for sure. GSOM. Never heard of it. Um, yeah, it's an IPO. It's kind of thin as an IPO. Um, I would I would wait for it to break out to new highs. And, and in the IPOs, we do occasionally play a breakout pattern. So if you're going to play the breakout, that's fine. Uh, but I would like to see it make new highs and stay there. Also, I'd like to see some uh, volume come in. A little thin on the volume. RTK for Mr. Rick. Good to see you, Rick. Okay. RTK. Uh, no. No, there's nothing here to get excited. The real thin on volume. Um, kind of basing out, if anything. Uh, wait for it to take off and then play a pullback. You do have some overhead supply. It's a long ways away, not a tremendous amount. So I'll know it when I see it. But no, that's that's uh, there's nothing there. I mean, if you if you look longer term, look at your net net longer term. Again, there's that net net thing running its ugly head. I mean, it depends on what day you pick, but still five months sideways action. So no, take that off your list for now. Somebody's like, oh, you beat you beat me up in every show. It's like, well, start picking better stocks. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> got mad at me. It's like, well, I'm just trying to teach you. No, same same sort of problem. Net, net, uh, look at that. Uh, one, two, three months. I mean, it's your first time in the show. Don't worry about it. Please don't be offended. But look at that. Straight sideways. And then what is this? A silver company? What did we deduce earlier? When we were doing that initial initial analysis, gold and silver not doing so hot. So in order for me to buy a gold or silver stock, it's going to have to be pretty freaking amazing stock. Okay, so toss that one out for sure. Box for Donald. Did we look at that one? Yeah, I think we did. MTL we looked at. Cousins we looked at. That's a good one. That's a CZZ. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, put that on your watch list. Obviously, it is. If you take a look at my momentum list, it's in there. I probably need to call this down a little bit. But you can see I need to clean it out. But you see the stocks in here mostly seriously trending. If not, I need to take them out. I accidentally copied some uh, bond funds over. But, yeah, that's in my list. ABO, yeah, that's that's in the list too. Look, number one in the list. There it is right there. Bam. Yeah, absolutely. But on a pullback. CLD, that should be in the list too. Where is it? Uh, wait for it. There it is right there. See? Wait for a pullback. Nice trending stock. So, yeah, you know if uh, – Andre, you know if they're trending. ESNC, it's probably in my list because it's trending. ESNC, where is it? There it is right there. See? Yes, yeah, so I can't argue with that. Um, maybe on a little bit more pullback as a trade, I'd like to see a little more knockout move because it had a pretty serious move in here. Now, keep in mind, it's kind of a penny stock, 300%. Eh, it was over several months, not quite a bottle rocket. Uh, but serious move, eh, could be a little dangerous, maybe a little bit deeper pullback. But, yeah, be careful with that one. But, yeah, good eye. Car Perdonal, C-A-R-B. Uh, all over the place, longer term. But, as I said earlier, personalities can change. One thing that kind of jumps out at me, it sort of was off to the races here, and then it kind of lost steam. It's still doing okay. Don't get me wrong, but it has lost some steam over the past several months. I know, but Dave, it's up 60%. I know, I know, I know, but it just kind of jumps out as losing steam. So let's see what happens on a pullback. But if we do some measurements in here, it's only up 13% over this last month. And it was level up like, what, 13% in one day? Yeah, 20% in one day. So it's lost some steam. Let's just see what happens on the pullback. But I'd be less excited about that than some other stuff. Easy PW. Easy PW. I need to hide a list. You guys are looking at this list, aren't you? You're calling off my list. <laughs> uh, yeah, keep it on your watch list, but it's just kind of going sideways in here. If you're long, stay long because it's kind of making nice little boxes on top of boxes. But uh, this would be a stock, believe it or not, that I would keep in my momentum list just because it has made these boxes on top of boxes. Wait to see if it breaks out and then look to play it. Angelo wants to know about TCMD. Good to see you, Angelo. TCMD. Uh, too many days of the pullback is what kind of jumps out at me. This is one that has been on my watch list, though, for quite a while. Keep it on your watch list, but you've got too many days of the pullback. But looks good. Beeson looks okay. Beeson has pulled back into its prior um, – little breakout. This was another one of the things that we didn't have enough time to cover today in stock selection, but you want to see stocks thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, thrust, in this case consolidate, thrust, and you want to see them pull back, but you don't want to see them pull back past that prior little breakout point. So it looks okay. I would keep it on my watch list, but I think I would pass as far as a setup because it's pulled back back to its prior little breakout level, okay? Do you have a minimum average dollar of volume that you use? Not exactly, Jim, uh, but sometimes I do kind of consider if it's a lower price issue and only trading a couple hundred thousand shares, then I take that into consideration. If it's a higher price issue and trading less than 200,000 shares, it's like, well, dollar value is much bigger it's trading millions and millions and millions of dollars, so I could be a little more lenient. So I don't do it directly with a formula, but I kind of do it in my head. Like, ooh, it's kind of you know, little dollar stock trading 200,000 shares. <laughs> Sam says, LN, beat me up. I could take it, LN. That's not bad. I mean, uh, too many days of the pullback, though. And you can see it broke out past its prior little, little top here, and then it came right back in. And then now it's kind of looking like a ledger cardiogram. So um, I would wait to see if it could make new highs. It's still a relatively new issue. It's still an IPO. Me. Me on a pullback. Me. MED. MED. Yeah, on a pullback. Sure, why not? Look at how thin it is, though. Really thin stock. So be careful. Now, it is $40 a share. Uh, let's say 100000 on average volume. So it's not super thin. 
but you can see how the perp the, uh, the, the per personality of the stock has changed. It kind of was electric cardiogram, and now it's kind of getting its act together. A little bit on the thin side, though. But yeah, it's got some uh, interesting uh, developing characteristics. It's beginning to accelerate higher. It's persistent. All those things we talked about earlier. So yeah, put that on your watch list. But be careful. A little bit on the thin side. Ah, sure. Pete wants to short S Gen. Let's take a look at it. That's going to be Seattle Genetics or something. The only problem with shorting biotechnology is it could be a little scary, be a little dangerous. Longer term, wide and loose, but shorter term, good eye on this one. And I'll tell you why. You've made that thrust down from highs, and now you've begun to pull back a little bit. So absolutely, I'll give you a high five on that one. But a little wide and loose longer term. And then the caveat, obviously, if you're shorting biotech, it can, it can be a little dangerous. You're welcome, Steve. Steve says, nice webinar. Thank you. LNTH, P short, LNTH. You're next, Phil. Uh, no. It, see, remember earlier we said gap against the trend? This is a gap against the trend. That's the first thing that jumps out at me. How many days in the pullback? All those, see, here's the thing. And, and I'd love for you to get the whole course because if you could just find one stock after going through the whole course, you pay for the course many times over. But at the least, you need to look at number of days in the pullback, net net change, gap against the trends, overhead resistance, persistence, acceleration, ability for stock to trade cleanly, and all those things we just talked about. Okay, and that's going to put you well on your way. So that's going to probably be 75 to 80 percent of what you need to know. The other, the other 20 percent is the other patterns that we didn't have time to cover, plus a little deliberate practice in going through the stocks or watching me pick stocks for a year to get you over that hump. So, but you can see the point I'm trying to make now is without soft selling is a lot of things that are already just said for free are showing up in the charts. TSCO, and if you do this, if you do this, don't worry about being bit up. What, who, who, who said that? What, what? I have a neighbor that goes, what? <laughs> yeah, what do you want to do with this? You want to short it? Well, it's already broken down. The bomb's already blown up. Looks like it's too late to short. I like to catch stocks when they're just kind of rolling over from high levels. Uh, too big of a gap down. Yeah, leave that alone. But, yeah, it looks like it's still in trouble. All right. Phil wants to look at Pandora. The only problem with Pandora is I don't like this big gap down here. I don't like all this trading above where it is. And are you looking to short it? Because it looks more like a short than a long. Now, if I was just seeing this as a possible short, I'd say, yeah, go for it. The only problem is it's it's rolling over at low levels. So I'd much prefer a start. Look, see this little arrow drew back in? I'd much prefer a short back here than I would at these longer-term low levels. Now, oh, as a short, Phil. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as a trade, but I, I just not, I'd prefer coming off of much higher levels. Yeah, good eye on that. Absolutely. As a short. ACIU for Rick. That's one I've been watching. But the problem is it's it's come down here and made new lows. This is actually, we got burn on this one, actually. Uh, it came down and made new lows, so I'd leave it alone until it could prove itself. Now, sometimes with IPOs, they they die out, and then they, they're born again. So put that on your born again list, but right now, no. Phil's bearish on me. And Angelo, too. Chipotle's a short. Well, it's a little wide and loose. Uh, I'm trying to think of, uh, make a joke about sharts with uh, Chipotle. <laughs> Weren't they going to change the name to In-N-Out? Uh, it's just at too low levels. to. Not that it can't go lower, but it's just kind of wide and loose and basin in here. I wouldn't short it at this juncture. ETE for Gary, that's going to be something energy. Uh, it's a pipeline. I'm not a huge fan of pipelines. But no. Uh, too many days of the pullback. If you're looking to short it, then eh. It's still at relatively low levels longer term. The time to short it was like right here. But Dave shows ahead of time. Well, if you find one that's rolling over from high levels, I'd be happy to look at it for you. Rim shot on that one. <laughs> Somebody actually got my little joke there. 
All right, thank you, Farah. Appreciate that. F S F L R. Uh, as a short, a lot of shorts coming up today. That's the first time ever. Uh, no, if you're going looking to go long, it's got too much overhead supply. If you're looking to short it, it's headed higher. So yeah, leave that alone. Oh, FSLR is long. No, Phil, uh, too much overhead supply. Uh, yeah, just too much. Don wants to know about NLNK. That's going to be what, Netlink? Uh, it's not bad. We did have this gap down here. We do have a little bit of overhead supply. It's not bad. I think this is on my list. Um, it will have some issues on the way back up, but it's not bad. It's not bad at all. Uh, you can count the, you know, quite a few days at a pullback if you're counting from this peak, but it almost made it to that peak. So, yeah, certainly certainly a not bad on that one. Okay. AXTI. Got time for a couple of more. Uh, not bad. Again, uh, needs a little bit more pullback, though, because the magnitude of this move higher is pretty serious. Let's back the chart out a little bit. Yeah, it's pretty serious run higher in this one, so I'd like to see more of a knockout move on that. Seco, I'm probably not going to like. I'm not a big fan of these these uh, educational stocks. And let's look at this. The net-net change. There's that net-net rearing its ugly head again. Depends on where you want to go. I mean, if you went to, uh, it's actually down 5% in two and a half months. So, yeah, there's nothing there for me. The problem with educational stocks, and I found this a few years ago, I was doing some mechanical testing. And some I haven't mechanically tested anything in quite a while, but this was the last mechanical testing I remember doing. And I don't necessarily do it because I'm trying to find a mechanical system, at least now. Early in my career, I did a lot, a lot of programming, and that probably – I would encourage you not to do that, but then it certainly did help me in a lot of ways. So it's one of those things where – I could tell you don't waste your time doing all that. Just look at charts, but I probably wouldn't be looking at charts had I not done all the programming. But one thing that did come, that did come from the programming, at least in the more re recent years, is the fact that educational stocks are choppy. Okay, Educational stocks and shipping stocks are choppy. So I'm going to need to see the mother of all setups in those sectors before I get too excited. And that's I'm just not a big fan of those type of stocks. MTL were recovered. Ren, I think we covered too. Yeah, we covered Ren. FTI for Gary. Uh, time for one or two more, maybe. Uh, this is waking up. This is an oil field stock. Yeah, put it on your watch list for sure. If you're long, stay long. Uh, ample volume has a little overhead supply, but it's getting through it. Yeah, absolutely. On a pullback, though. Let it see if it can keep breaking out and then maybe on a pullback. Okay. Q-I-B-R-Q. -Q. What the heck is that? Q-I-B-R-Q. -I, I think I saw that one. I don't remember what it is, though. Q-I-B-R-Q. -I, I think I got to put a period in there or something, right? Because of the way telechart works, or at least with this one. Might not be able to pull it up on the fly. Q-I-B-R-Q. -I, -I, nope. I can't pull that one up. QIBR dash Q. QIBR dash Q. No, oh, um, we're just going to have to pass on that one. Oh, now Q. Oh, now Q. Oh, not Q. Oh, OIBR Q. O I B R Q O I B R Well this has become an exercise of futility. <laughs> well let's end it on a low note. <laughs> uh any unanswered questions, shoot me an email at daviddavelandry.com. Somebody can figure out the real symbol on that. Shoot me a uh shoot me an email too. I know which one you're talking about. I've seen it quite often. Uh but I just can't think of the symbol. Anyway, I have a blast doing these shows as you can tell. Any unanswered questions, shoot me an email. As usual, thanks, everybody, for coming. And then I'll see you guys uh, again 
next week. Uh, in a few weeks, I will be taking a week off for Traders Expo, and then after that will be Thanksgiving. So there will be a gap in the shows. But if you're signed up for this one, you should be signed up for all the shows, and I'm going to start adding some new shows in uh, at, at the beginning of the year. So you should be signed up for the rest of your shows for this year. Anyway, uh, and if you have trouble signing up, let me know because we seem to have a lot of trouble with that. Anyway, I think that's a – I think that's pretty much it. Uh, any questions, again, shoot me an email, and I'll cover. I'll answer you directly, or if it requires a little bit more thought, I'll um, answer it next week. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great uh, weekend if we don't talk to you now and then.